Hey, Westside, welcome here this morning. It's, we're so glad you joined us. Uh, today, it is cold out. So how great is it that you can tune in, stay warm, and get connected? We hope it's our prayer, connected to God. And also, we hope that it is a, you feel this connection to each other. So to that end, we're going to have communion after this service. So get your communion supplies ready. And let's pray and we'll begin. So Lord... Thank you again for all you are, all you do, and even though uh, we are here and other people are there in their homes tuning in, we pray that there is this great connection to you, that there is a real meaningful connection with each other because we are yours and we are your community, Lord. Uh, so may everything we do here bring you glory and honor, and we thank you for this opportunity to get together in your name. Amen. So Jordan has joined us this morning to lead us in uh, a song to start us off. So I will kick it over to you. Let's sing together. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up. Till I lay my head, I will sing all the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made. the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. In darkest night, you were close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend, and I will lift of the goodness of God all my life. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I'll give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Yeah. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, just so appreciate so many folks in our church who are so gifted and talented and invested in what God is doing at Westside through Westside. And that's what we want to talk about. We have a new series that we're starting today. And it's all about our vision statement. And we've titled it, Who Do We Think We Are? Who? And we phrase it that way because this is a good time for us to have a conversation of who are we? How are we accomplishing God's mission? In what ways are we doing that? In what ways are we, are we challenged? Are we 
perhaps falling short, uh, missing opportunities for what God has for us. And how are we shaped then as a church? So we have a vision statement here, and I know you all know the vision statement. So say it now without me putting up uh, the actual vision statement. Do you know it? Do you know it? It's been in our bulletin forever. It's online. It's on the website. Who do we think we are? Well, 10 years ago, we came up with this statement. I'll let, I'll let you in on it. Love Jesus. Love people. Lives transformed. Now, anyone who's ever been part of a Maybe it's part of business, like finding this right vision statement, focus statement, purpose statement, mission statement. However you want to phrase it, frame it. We're always like, some, some people love stuff like this and other people's eyes glaze over as soon as they're talking about having a vision statement. So if you have a meeting about it or you're going to have 10 meetings about it because you're going to argue about the words and the ideas and the values that are given, shown, reflected in our statements, you eventually got to decide on something. You have to figure it out. You have to make some choices. So the choices were made were loving Jesus, and out of loving Jesus, we love people. And then through that, as, pe- as Jesus is loved, as people are loved, lives are transformed. There is healing. And I remember we've had arguments about that word transformed. Was that strong enough? Was it too weak? What does it mean? Is it too ambiguous? Is it powerful enough? Well, eventually, it seemed to be the best word at the time for us. So we thought we're 10 years in to this vision statement, uh, helping this statement frame who we are. And let's revisit it. Let's reconnect to it. And let's learn from it and see how it uh, shapes up, especially in a time where, again, the last two years have been really unique for us. And even today, again, as we choose to meet this way versus in person, Uh, what does that mean? How do we love Jesus? How do we love people? How are lives transformed? When so much of who we think we are, even if we might not say it, so much is connected to Sunday morning gathering. That's the time when we get together. And talking about this uh, season, or seven or eight seasons, which we're into now, with a pandemic, with other pastors and speaking with other pastors, the conversation could be like, who are we when we don't have Sunday morning to accomplish maybe teaching together, connecting with each other, worshiping God together, all those great things that happen on a Sunday morning when you gather in person. Is that the main thing of who we are as a church? Is it Sunday morning? So in this past year or two, what has been really good for us and a really teaching moment for us is that does not, uh, Sunday morning does not dictate who we are or how we accomplish God's mission for us as a church. So we actually get to, to exercise and flex our souls in different areas, be it through mission, community care, connecting with each other uh, through media, uh, just working hard in different ways. So we thought, what a great time. And we thought we would be together. We thought we'd have, during the week, uh, think tanks and workshops. And so when we go to this season again of, oh, we're going to go online for a bit. We're like, well, maybe we should defer. And we're like, no, now is the time. Now is the time for us to understand who we are, who do we think we are, and for us to continue to have this conversation. So throughout these, this month, these next four weeks, there's going to be an opportunity for you to give feedback There's going to be opportunity on Wednesday nights. We're going to uh, begin again our prayer meetings on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. Join us for prayer. Get connected. Pray for each other. If you'd like prayer for yourself, uh, join us Wednesday uh, via Zoom this week. Stay tuned every week for how it's going to happen. Uh, But as you walk, we're going to walk through our vision statement. Love Jesus. Love people. Lives transformed. What does that mean for us at Westside? Now, We're going to start today with, this is good, love Jesus, love people, lives transformed. We didn't want to start with love Jesus, because there's something that comes first. And that something that comes first is this foundational truth that we're going to walk through today of, you are loved by God. We are loved by God. And we need to have an understanding 
of what it means to be loved by God. Now I say that, and I think you hear that, and you're like, well, what does it mean? I'm loved by God. Like, do you believe you're loved by God, first of all? Like right now, wherever you're sitting, whenever you're, wherever you're taking this in, do you feel God's love? Do you know God's love? You sit there and go, I am so loved by God. It blows me away. I'm amazed. Or do you sit, and as you take that question in, do you know, do I know that I'm loved by God? Do you, you know, I really feel unlovable. I really feel like, oh, if you look at my relationships, if you look how I'm living my life right now, I'm not sure God loves me. I'm not sure God could love me. And maybe it's something from deep in our past. Maybe it's something just, it could be just this day-to-day numbness. You're like, no, I haven't been doing my devotions. I haven't been praying. I need to read my Bible. We just had New Year's resolutions. I said I was going to draw closer to God, and this week doesn't look much better than it did, uh, than my weeks did in the years prior or last year. I don't feel more connected. I don't even know if I want to. I didn't feel the desire. So then it's hard to feel someone's love when you're, not feel, when you're not craving that love or feel you're undeserving of it. Well, that's where we're going to start today. We're just going to spend a few moments in a few scriptures because the foundational truth of, the, of the, the fact that you are loved by God, that we are loved by God, shapes everything. It informs my life. It lets me know that I need to live my life a certain way because of the love that has been given, shown to me. So when I ask you the question, how do you know you're loved by God? And you're going to hear throughout the week, we're going to post things. uh, People are going to write in. People have already sent some videos in, some clips. And we're going to be playing that throughout the week of that question, how do you know you're loved by God? And let me just give you a little bit of a a something here. Uh, when, When you're asked that question, what do you think? Like last night it was really cold. This whole few weeks have been really cold. Sometimes I think I can feel the love of God because I have a warm house. Sometimes I think I'm loved by God. I I know I'm loved by God. I could say something like, oh, the love of my wife just extends so much grace to me. Uh, I could say the love of, I feel the love of God because I have the love of parents. My mom and my dad, you know, really love me. And it can be all of that. That can be where I'm drawn to. But can I take us to a different place? Because there is something that... Uh, that informs my understanding of being loved by God, that this is what it can't be. It can't be a warm house. Because that means if I don't have a warm house, I don't feel loved by God. If I'm homeless, I don't feel loved by God. Maybe if I'm in prison, I don't feel loved by God. Maybe I'm in a refugee camp. Well, then I won't feel the love of God until I have a warm house. Until I have the love of a, of a spouse. Until I have children. It can't be that. It has to go to a deeper, more universal level because we're talking about the God of the the universe, the God of the cosmos. Can we go there? So if if we took away those descriptors of how we feel loved by God, what would we be left with? How do you know the love of God? Well, Scripture takes us, the the few texts that we're going to go into today uh, just will quickly reveal why God loves us, how he loves us, and what that should do for us. So that's where we're going to start today. So um, turn your Bibles to John 3.16. Most of you don't even have to turn into your Bibles. Most of you know this verse. Probably the most famous verse in the Bible. And it goes like this. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. So this is kind of the why. Verse 16. For this is how God loved the world. Like God loves the world. That word uh, for world is cosmos. And so it is this big universal word. But when we think of the word world, like if you've read your Bible before or you've been a part of church Usually when the word world is mentioned, it's not a good thing. Like, do not love the world. Do not love the things of this world. Do not be lured in by the world. You should be in the world, but not of the world. And here we have, for God so loved the world. 
that world. So right off the bat here, John is saying that God loves it all. And he loves it all so much. It, doesn't, it does not mean that God loves everything that is happening in the world. In a fallen world like we have. Does not love our sin. Does not love all that. But he loves the people. He loves the created order. And he loves it so much. This is what he is willing to do. So first off, he loves the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish. So there is something here about that, in that word perish, which is like will not be annihilated, annihilated or cease to exist. So these people will not cease to exist because they're created for so much more. But have eternal life. This is what you're created for, eternal life. But through our actions and our decisions, and our decision to follow our own path instead of God's path for our lives, God's will for our lives, that there is something at stake here and not just something small. There is our perishing that is at stake. So right at the front end of John 3.16, we have the idea of rescue. We have to have this understanding in God's love for us, this understanding that we are being rescued for something, from something. Now, if we don't feel that we are in need of rescue, then this verse won't mean much to you. Like, so what? I, I, I'm not in need of rescue. I'm fine. I thought of um, this idea of if I don't need to be rescued from something, it's really hard to rescue me. And I thought of uh, the idea of a cult. If I was a part of a cult, if you're a part of a cult and someone comes like, like, this isn't good. Like, you are... You are not the same. You are being drawn down a path that leads to destruction. This is messed up. Well, that's kind of what the world has to offer us. We are lured into it. We are entranced by it. And we want what that, the cult of the world brings. And we're not in a place, so often we're not in a place to see our desperate need for rescue. So in God's love for us, he says, I will rescue you. And I will rescue you by giving my son, by giving myself. Like part of the Trinity, a third of it. I'm going to give myself to you to die for you. So that you will not perish, but have eternal life. So that's the first. That's, that's the why I created this. I love you so much. I give myself to you. And then 1 John 4.10. We stick with John. And he says, this is real love. Not that we loved God but that God loves us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Again, again that understanding of rescue, that understanding of you are loved, not because of your performance, not because of you have done so many good things that I love you now. Now you've done enough that I love you. Now you're not as bad as you were and I love you. Not that you will ne from now on not sin, so I will love you. You've made this decision. It is just you are created and I love you. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that God loves us. Before we have made any decision to follow God, you are loved. We are loved. God knows you and still loves you. How beautiful a truth is that right now as, as you sit there, as you take this in, Know that God loves you. As you are sitting there, as you are thinking, whatever you are thinking, as you are pondering, as whatever you did last night, whatever you did yesterday, however you messed up, God loves you. We have to understand that and know that because that then shapes and informs us of how we will live our life. It lets me know, okay, I will do this because I'm loved by God. I am worth this. It gives me ultimate int intrinsic value and my identity is firmly rooted in a loved being. So often we do not feel loved. So often we feel like we are left out, we are pushed to the side and God is like, no, there is so much more for you. I love you unconditionally. A beautiful truth. And if I'm not loved because of my goodness... If I'm not loved because I'm so well behaved, then I can't not be loved by my bad actions. So if I can't earn it, I also can't lose that love. 
That's a beautiful truth for us. So, because often throughout my life, it's like I've been good for a bit and then not. I've been good for a bit and then lose my path. And that is so much of our story is, oh, I thought I would be further along in my spiritual path and journey that I wouldn't act this way. I wouldn't have um, behaved in that manner. It's got nothing about me earning it, nothing about my performance. That's the beauty of it. But the love of God is central and firm and good. Hard for us to understand. Ephesians 3, 18 to 19. The fact that this can be really hard to understand, like love is a kind of a bizarre concept already. Now the love of God takes to a few more levels of how do we know this? It's hard enough for me to understand the love of someone or how I am to love someone even if they're right in front of me, even if I'm married to them. Kids, uh, they're my kids. It can be difficult for me to grasp the concept of love, especially unconditional love, because we're so human. Well, Ephesians 3, 18 to 19 says, hey, that's all right. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is, how wide it is. God's love is everywhere. How long it is. God's love is never ending. How high it is, uh, that is a universal term of there is nothing that can separate us from that love and how deep it is. Think of the deepest, darkest places of you. God's love is there. Whatever you are ashamed of, you grieve, God is there. Whatever you are suffering through, God is there, right there. And then verse 19, may you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. So if you're having difficulty with the concept or you grasp it, but it's fragile and you lose it, that's okay. That's what, that's what the story of Ephesians is uh, all about. This letter is, this is a mystery. This is hard to understand. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Give yourself some grace as well. Allow God's grace to to shape you. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. And we're going to go into that as we talk about in three weeks time, lives transformed. What being loved by God does for our lives, it will transform us. So verse 18 is all about knowing it. May you know it. May you know in those four directions, God's love. And then verse 19, may you experience it. And Paul is writing this from prison. Remember that. So the warm house, everything's going well in your life. Um, As we are prone to look at our circumstances to dictate or help us fully understand the love of God. Take that away. Paul doesn't have that. What is Paul focusing on? I don't know. He's in chains. Maybe these chains don't chafe as much as the other chains. Maybe he's able to appreciate the small things. Or maybe as the chains chafe, He understands the love of God even more of the pain that Jesus went through for his sake. Whatever our circumstances is, there is something for us to know and experience about God's love. Whatever struggle you are going through, may you know it, may you experience it. And may you understand, may we understand that, oh, okay, the money came in or all this. This is not a a dictator of God's love. Oh, now you're loved. Now I experience it. God's love was present the entire time. But when we feel unloved, when we feel our circumstances are not going well, when we feel that we are not valued, it can be really difficult. And, I, and it's at that point that we're like, sometimes I ask the question, do I even know God when you're not feeling God's love? Because there's, there are all these competing voices. Donald Miller has a quote, and I says this, if we hear in our inner ear a voice saying we are failures, we are losers, we will never amount to anything. This is the voice of Satan trying to convince the bride that the groom does not love her. This is not the voice of God. God woos us with kindness and sacrifice. That's in those verses. This is who God is. God is love. This is what God is willing to do for us, actually give himself. Evil forces, though, are trying to compete with that voice of love all the time. And I'm here to tell you, the Bible is here to tell you, Jesus is here to tell you, God is here to tell you that you are loved. Not performance-driven. 
Romans 8, 38 to 39. I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Nothing can separate us. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God. That is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us. I'm going to close with a quote from Desmond Tutu. God's love is like when you sit in front of a fire in winter. You are just there in front of the fire. You don't have to be smart or anything. The fire warms you. That is the love of God. The fire is always present. The fire is always available and is always yours to rest in front of God's love. And then the truth of the matter is, as any case with real love, choice and freedom are available to us. We can choose, I can choose to sit in front of that fire and take God's love in, or I can choose to be, move away from that warmth. And I can choose my own path and to sit in the cold and to be entranced by something other than God's will for me, my life, this earth, this world, this kingdom. That's the choice, and that's real love. We always have that choice. Well, so who do we think we are? Here's how we're going to start it. Who do we think we are? We think we're loved by God. In fact, we kind of know it. We know we're loved by God. Join us Wednesday evening for prayer. Grab your communion supplies, because there is nothing. And like I said, uh, as we were gathered, the, the few of us that are here getting ready, communion is always relevant to the message. Strange how that is. So grab your communion supplies. Let's start with the bread. In Luke 22, 19, Jesus says he took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and he gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. Let's pray. So Lord, for the bread and for the juice, they represent your love for us, your sacrifice for us, And more than anything, Lord, you want us to know that we are loved and that you will do and have done anything and everything for us to know that, Lord. So I pray, Lord, through communion, through your word, through people's love, may people know they are loved by God. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, with my sacrifice. I do this for you, and we do this in remembrance of the sacrifice of God for us. Thanks for joining us this morning. Jordan's going to end, send us out with a song. We just so long and pray that you know the love of God. I pray that for myself, that I know the love of God. It's a journey for me. It's it's a journey for a lot of us. But God's way is the best way. And we're going to sing about that this morning. Go with God. Jordan.
Maybe that mountain saved my heart from a valley. Maybe that desert taught me to pray for rain. And maybe that water never parted for a reason. And you're leading me a better way. A million details only you see I see a fraction of the grand scheme But you have heaven's point of view Yeah And maybe that mountain Saved my heart from a valley Maybe that desert that taught me to pray for rain. Maybe that water never parted for a reason. And you're leading me a better way. If you lead me through the fire, there's a reason for the flames. I will trust, I will believe that it's a better way. If you lead me into battle, then the fight is not in vain. I will trust, I will believe that it's a better way. If you lead me through the fire, there's a reason for Trust I will believe that it's a better way. If you lead me into battle, then the fight is not in vain. I will trust I will believe that it's a better way. And maybe that mountain saved my heart from a valley. Maybe that desert. Taught me to pray for rain And maybe that water Never parted for a reason And you're leading me a better way Have a great week.